Okay, so, um, so let's start. Uh, we are beginning the home stretch of this semester. We are uh, after some introduction and we'll continue the introduction today. Uh, but really start to see machine learning. Hopefully you, you all had a good weekend, rested, and we can uh, start. So, so first, let me just um, start with a few administrative things. Um, so yes, we are um, recording this. Uh, and uh, we had some technical problems, but the recordings will all be available uh, on the website. I want to remind you homework zero. Um, please complete it. It's really mandatory. And, and from the amount of discussions, I, uh, we can see that it's non-trivial, which is uh, exactly what we wanted. But, uh, but it's important to bring this information to the top of your head. Uh, so you uh, remember these things. And you'll see the need for this already today. Um, uh, office hours are beginning to be routine now, so please go to the office hours. Um, you can talk about homework zero, you can talk about any other things. The recitations this week, both recitations are going to be devoted to discussing background material that is relevant to homework zero and will be relevant in the rest of the semester. So please go, uh, definitely go if you if you feel that you have some holes uh, in, this, in this material. We're going to start this week with quiz one. Uh, the quizzes are going to become available to you on Thursday evening and are going to be due on Sunday night. It's supposed to take just a few minutes, just again to bring the material that we are talking about to the top of your head so that coming Monday morning, you're all, uh, you're all set. And next week, we are also going to release the first homework. Uh, and this homework is going to be um, a real machine learning, uh, a small machine learning project. Uh, Python is going to be used uh, heavily, so brush up on that if you're not completely sure. Um, OK, so, so I don't know about you, but from my perspective, we're still struggling with this new venue. Uh, so I'm used to kind of talk to the people in the auditorium or, or the classroom or wherever we are, and it's a little bit more difficult now. So please uh, ask questions. Uh, it's okay to, uh, I, I cannot really follow the chat. So I count on the TAs to alarm me if there's something really important in the chat, but during the uh, lecture, I cannot really do it. So uh, feel free to, uh, turn on your mic. I mean, I really appreciate that everyone is on mute most of the time, but turn it on if you want to ask something or say something. Um, turn on your video uh, and, and ask a question or, or respond in any way. Um, I'm also looking for feedback and suggestions for how to run this semester in the best way, both for you and for me. Uh, please feel free to send me email, write on Piazza, make comments here. I'm going to ask for some comments at the end of today. So um, any comments before we start? OK, so let's, let's, uh, let's remind ourselves where were we last time. Uh, so we basically uh, talked about supervised learning. Uh, so I introduced the three kind of key concepts. We talked about what is an instance space. On the left, what is an output space, a label space. Um, and assuming that the animation is going to work here. Wow, what's happening? Okay. We know that the mapping from the input space to the output space is, is some target function that we don't know, but it exists. And our task is to uh, learn a model that behaves 
exactly as or approximately similar to this target function. And the space of all functions that our algorithm considers as candidate for this G of X is going to be called the hypothesis space. So with this concept that we're going to exemplify again later today, uh, uh, we highlighted the key issues in machine learning. So one of them is modeling, how to formulate a problem as a machine learning problem, how to represent the data, and what are the learning protocols. Um, and we're going to discuss this <coughs> again throughout <laughs> the semester. What is the representation, the second component? And representation really is two components here. So what function should we learn, the hypothesis space, and how do we represent the input uh, in the instance space? Um, and finally, algorithms. What algorithms, what are good algorithms? How do we define when an algorithm is successful or not? And of course, the computational problem. So as computer scientists, we care about how expensive is it uh, to, to learn or to develop uh, or to run these algorithms. Also today, I want to go in more details into these concepts, mostly instance space and hypothesis space. Um, Slow the and, before I work out. We don't have any uh, So please we'll mute if you're lunch. not. Please mute your mic. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, I'm not going to talk a lot about the label space at this point because we're going to assume for the most part that the labels are Boolean, yes and no. So positive and negative. And we'll begin to formal, formalize representations and modeling and hopefully we'll get to see the first learning algorithm. Uh, what's that? Okay, so, so just to remind ourselves, the instant space is the space of all inputs that the algorithm sees. We talked uh, last time a little bit about this application that you see on the left. Give an ML message, try to classify it and file it into one of many folders. And we talked about what kind of features we can get. So we talked about the class of Boolean features, uh, and we talked about numerical features and maybe just bag of tokens. I also asked this question that we left unanswered and it's okay to leave unanswered for now. We're gonna come back to it, uh, but it's something to think about. Uh, given that I already mentioned, does this email contain the word class? That's a Boolean feature, either yes or no. Does this email contain the word waiting? Yes or no? Uh, does the last feature here, does this email contain both the word class and the word waiting? Does it give us something? Does it add any value beyond these two? Uh, it's not a trivial question. It's actually a meaningful question uh, because you can say, well, there's no more information here, but Keep this in mind and, and we wanna, I, I wanna come back to it a little bit later. But anyhow, this gives us some idea of what is the instant space. Uh, uh, and of course you can think about examples for the case of the badges uh, that we thought about last time. And you will also think about it in, in homework one because you will see this data set again. The important thing is that we're gonna have a lot of features and we're gonna represent this uh, feature space as a vector space. So X is going to be an n-dimensional vector space, could be Boolean feature, 0, 1, could be real valued features, R, of dimensionality N in both cases. Uh, and each element there is going to be some vector 
So you can think about this vector as a point in some space. I don't know how to draw more than two or three dimensions, but you can imagine uh, a very high dimensional space where each point is, uh, is an example, or which example is a point. So we already, from the discussion that we had, hopefully realized that good features are, imp are important. If we don't know which features to use, uh, for example, in the badges game, if you were focusing on visual features, uh, you wouldn't get it. Um, I gave you last time the example of two very expressive neural networks, one token-based and one character-based, and you could see that the token-based, even though it was a very, very big and expressive model, didn't get it. Could not learn from the data given because it did not use the right features. Um, so so that, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, the label spy, just to give an example, because we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, uh, just positive and, and negative is not the only option, right? So you can think about K possible labels, like in the folders in my email uh, example, or you can think even about graphs or structures as labels. So, so think about the image on the left. What I want to do there is I want to not only identify the kitten, but I want to identify parts of the kitten. This is the ear, this is the head, this is the neck, this is the left eye, and clearly there are relations between these. Well, I expect the ear to be above the neck, for example. So, so the labels that I'm going to assign here are not independent labels, they are interrelated. And similarly on the text example, on the right, if I have events like meeting, leaving for Paris, and Thursday, and I want to identify the temporal relations between them. What's before, what's after, what's overlapping or included. Again, there are relations between these th things and they are not independent um, labels. So, so this is another case of a why that we're not going to talk a lot about this semester, but, but really an interesting uh, machine learning area. Okay, so finally we get to the model uh, and this is, the functions that we're going to learn, and we're going to have to choose what kind of models we want to learn. Question so far, oh, before we get there. Hi, Professor. Um, I had a question. Go ahead. Could you please? Um, Specify again, like what's the difference between a token versus a, a feature? So a token is, for example, a word. Uh, feature is a term in machine learning. Feature can be a part of an image. Feature can be uh, anything that could be in the input. Uh, if the input is text, one possible feature would be a token. Another possible feature would be characters and so on. So, so feature is a general term, whatever the input is, whether it's audio or visual or medical data or text, features are gonna be there. Um, what exactly does label mean in label data? So, so let's take the badges example. Uh, in the badges, we gave you uh, pairs. Each example was a pair. There was a name and there was a positive negative, plus or minus. The plus or minus is the label. It tells me whether this name is a positive example or a negative example. Uh, does that answer the question? What exactly, what exactly does the label mean? Okay. Uh, okay, I'm trying to look, so. Okay, so, so, so let's leave the question about training and test to a later time, we're gonna discuss this. Uh, 
neural network. We are going to work a little bit with neural network, uh, not a lot. Probably one or two of the problem sets are going to devoted to, be devoted to this. I really would like to freeze the screen. Let's see, but it's not working. A hypothesis space, that's really an important uh, uh, concept. And I'm going to go now to uh, discuss hypothesis space. So let's let's just leave this and ask this question again uh, later. The PPT on the website is not the most updated version. True, the PPT on the website is always going to be updated after the lecture, with the lecture that I'm giving today, uh, potentially with a few updates uh, as a function of your questions. What you have there before the lecture is some draft that is pretty close, but not exactly the same. Uh, okay, so let's move on. And here's a learning problem. So hopefully this will uh, uh, also uh, help us to understand the, the concept that we are talking about here. So, so what do we have here? We, oh, we have uh, input. The input is x1, x2, x3, x4. This is the example. And then we have a box that is the unknown function. We don't know which one it is. And once this input goes into this box, it produces the label, which is the value of the function on this input, x2, x1, x2, x3, x4. So now I'm going to give you examples. The left side here, under x1, x2, x3, x4, are the examples. So example number one is 0, 0, 1, 0. Its label is y, y equals 0, negative example. The second example is 0, 1, 0, 0, uh, and the label is 0 again. The seventh example is x1 equals 0, x2 equals 1, x3 equals 0, x4 equals 1. The label again is 0. That's the learning problem. And the question is, uh, can you learn this function? Can you induce, induce what function is it? So think a little bit about it. Look at the data. Uh, and I'm going to ask you this question and go back to show you the suggest a function uh, given this data. So write it in Word or write it in mathematical notations, whatever you want. Uh, and suggest a function that might be the function here in this box that has generated these labels when I gave it these examples. So you are now the learner. You're running whatever machine learning algorithm you want in your mind. And your job is to tell me what is the hidden function. So think a little bit. Um, I'm going to move to the next one. This is your task now uh, to suggest a target function that could have generated this data. Okay, so let's, let's see what you guys are thinking. I don't want you to suggest an algorithm. I want to suggest a function. Here's an example, x4 and not x2. No idea, hash table. Again, I don't want, a general method, I want a function. Here's another suggestion, two of x1, x3, and x4, but not x2. Uh, complicated, I'm gonna choose this one to look at, x4 and x1 or x2 or x3. Okay, let's go back and look at uh, this function for those of you that haven't. So, um, so, so far we've seen several suggestions. For example, one of the suggestions was x4 and not x2. Let's try to see if this is 
this function is correct. So if x for x for n logical n, not x2, means that if x4 is 1 and x2 is 0, it should be a positive example. x4 is 1 here. I assume you can see my mouse, right? Uh, x4 is 1 and x2 is 0. It's, ex it's a positive example. Uh, and these are the only two examples. So that works. But someone else gave another function x4 and either x1 or x2 or x3. Let's try that. So x4 must be 1, and one of these three is 1, which holds here. x4 is 1, and one of them is 1 that holds. But it doesn't hold here, because here x4 is 1, and one of x1, x2, x3 is one, but it's still a negative example. But we can correct it to be just x4 and x1 or x3. Let's try this. x4 is on, and one of x1 or x3 is on. It works here. It works here. Here x4 is 1, uh, and none of x1 or x3 is on, and it, indeed it's a negative example. So that everything works. So now we have two functions. I'm sure you have other functions here. Let's try to see. So, so so let let just maybe you can write down this for yourself because uh, one one function is x four n not x two. Another one is x four and x one or x three in parentheses. Uh, are these the same function? It's actually not the same function. It's not the same function in the sense that uh, there are some examples on which one of these functions is going to say yes, and another is going to say no. Uh, OK, let's see if I can write this down here. An experiment. Uh, Okay, I will not do this experiment. <laughs> so let's move on uh, and, and to talk about it. Okay. So, so what I have here um, are all the possible examples um, that we can have if we have four features, x1 up to x4. These are Boolean features. So everything we have is all zeros, all the way up to all ones. Think about it, these are 16 examples. Uh, so um, because there are 16 examples, and y is also Boolean, I'm arguing that there are two to the 16 possible functions over these features. Think a little bit uh, about it. So for each input here, 0, 0, 0, 0, or 0, 0, 1, 0, and so on, I can choose one of two options here, either 0 or 1 for the y. So it's two options for the first one times two option for the second and so on. So I have uh, two to the 16 different functions. A function is basically defined by this row of y's here. And there are two to the 16 different vectors like this. 
quite a few functions, 65K uh, possible functions. You only gave me uh, two or three different functions. Uh, now, are all these functions really possible? Probably not, because I already told you some of the labels, right? So I gave you seven of the labels. You can see here um, that in some of the rows, I gave you what is the zero and what is the one. So what is left? There are nine examples for which I did not give you the label. These are the question marks here. So how many functions are really left after I gave you the seven examples? Anyone can shout? Two to the power of nine. Two to the power of nine, because there are 16 examples. Seven of them I fixed. I gave you the label, but there are nine places, nine examples for which we don't know what the labels are. So there are two to the nine possible functions. Uh, you gave me just a few. How much is two to the nine? It's 512. So, so there are over 500 different functions that you could have learned given the data that I gave you. Uh, and really there's no way to make a distinction between them, right? So after observing seven examples, we still have two to the nine possibilities for F and I have no idea which one is right. Uh, you gave me a few, uh, which one is, is correct? Is learning even possible given this? So of course I can give you all 16 examples with labels, but then there's no learning, right? I basically gave you the function. Once I give you just a few examples and ask you to learn a function that will allow you to make predictions on the rest, what we see here from this very simple example is that there are way too many options. How can we tell which one is right? Uh, and this is where the notion of hypothesis space comes in. Uh, if I were to tell you everything is possible, all possible functions over this space of four input features uh, are possible, then there'll be 512 options and no idea which one is preferred. Um, this, is, this is just uh, a detour to make sure that we know how I did this math here. There are size Y, which is two in our case, to the power of size X, which is 16, the number of possible Xs, possible functions from the instance space X to the label space Y. And a learner typically consider only a subset of this function. The subspace, of functions is the hypothesis space. And typically this H, the hypothesis space is gonna be much, much smaller than the set of all possible functions. So let's take an example. So let's assume I tell you, you know what? Only consider functions that are simple conjunctions like this. Y must be a conjunction of some variables, X1 and X3 and X4 or something like that. I'm putting here again the examples that I showed you, and I'm giving you here um, a list of all these conjunctions. So there are conjunction of size one, just X1 or X2, X3, X4, conjunction of size two, and conjunction of size three, and one conjunction of size four. Uh, what I'm showing you here in red is the counter example, why this is not the right function. For example, X1 is not the right function because the example 1100 zero, zero is negative, but if this was the right function, it should have been positive. The, let's look at X3 and X4. This is not the right function because the example 1001 is positive, but if X3 and X4 was the function because X3 is negative here, it should have been a negative example. So basically you can check this and see that with this hypothesis space of simple conjunctive rules, there are just 
no function is consistent with the data I gave you. This is not a good hypothesis space. Um, now, on the other hand, I can enlarge the hypothesis space and I'm gonna define a set of functions that I call M out of N rules. What I mean by this, I mean that um, Y is one, the label is one, if and only if at least M of the following N variables are on, are one. Here, is, here are some examples. So um, let's assume that the set of variables, you see, out of these n variables. Uh, let's assume that the set of variables is x1 and x2. Uh, I can assume that one of these is on. This is one of the concepts. But uh, example number two here, this one, 0, 1, 0, 0, is a negative example for this. It shows that if one of these is true, it's not true because in this example, one of them, x2, is on, but the example is negative. And this way you can go over all these and you'll see that the, the indices here are the indices uh, into counter examples, but this one actually works. So let's go to this one. So the set of variables I have is x1, x3, x4. If two of them are on, two out of, x1 or x3 or x4, then I claim that this is consistent with the table. Let's check uh, at least two of them. Uh, so let's look at the positive examples. It's true. In this case, x3 and x4 are on. In this case, x1 and x4 are on. And every other case where uh, not two of these are on, is actually a negative example. Again, you can go and check. So I learned the function, right? So I learned the function um, two out of x1, x3, x4 is a good function because it's consistent with the data. Notice that it's different than the two functions that I isolated from your answers. It's different than the function x4 and not x2. It agrees with it on these seven examples, but in general, it's not the same function. You can find an example on which my function is positive and yours is negative or vice versa. So, so what have we done here? And of course we can continue here and play with other hypothesis spaces. But the bottom line is that given the hypothesis space, we found a, uh, a function that is consistent with it. Uh, Okay, so, so now uh, what are we doing here? This is really a toy example. And someone asked already a question about neural network. So don't worry. This function, even though I'm presenting it in such simplistic way, it's actually a neural network. You can write this and we are gonna do this as a neural network where the XIs are the inputs. Here on the left side of this new figure. Uh, there are gonna be some weights here. And there's gonna be a summing function and this will give us the value of the function. So this really can be written as a neural network, much, much easier to understand what we are doing if we represent it this way. Uh, moreover, you can ask, okay, so, so what is happening here? So, so Professor Roth is giving us a toy example and it's showing us that there's a lot of options given to learn a given set of examples uh, and you don't know which one is the right one. But this is just in this toy example. In the real world, when we have a lot of data, we're gonna converge to the right function, right? Well, wrong. So let's just play with a couple other examples. So I'm gonna, I have here two examples. I'm gonna try to run uh, real demos, real time. Otherwise I'll resort to my screenshots here. Let's see what happens. So I'm going to stop this, bring up uh, this. Okay. Can you see this screen? MLN demo? Yep. Yeah, excellent. Okay. So what is the hottest things today in machine learning? Uh, the hottest things is big, big language models. You probably heard about it in the newspapers. Um, 
And, and what I'm going to give you here is a sh short demo of a few language models. So on the left side, I chose three big language models. One of them is a Roberta, is a BERT-based uh, model. Some of you might have heard about BERT, which is uh, kind of really a, a breakthrough uh, in uh, language model of natural language. And two of them are different Roberta, which is following the BERT model, but even larger uh, models. Um, so I'm going to input a sentence and try to see what is the prediction of this model on this data. So here is one sentence. Elephants are something than mice. And I want to see what does the model think? What does the model predict as a way to complete the sentence and fill this mask? So let's just focus now on uh, bigger and smaller. Uh, the model gives me 10 options here. So this model, for example, tells me that bigger is more likely than stronger, than, than smaller, sorry. You can see this. Bigger is the second here, smaller is the second from the last. So elephants are more likely to be bigger than smaller. But the second model thinks that actually smaller here is more likely than bigger. So it's one model. Uh, train on the same data, but the predictions that the model makes are different. So the function that this model encodes or these two models encode are different. Let's change the input. Let, let's see what do they think about. So notice that this guy was actually uh, right. It's thought that bigger elephants are more likely to be bigger than, small, than, than mice. Let's, let's change this. Mice, are are mask than elephants okay let's look now the large model that we looked at before now thinks that bigger is the top choice so mice are bigger than elephants Smaller is not even in the top 10. On the other hand, this model thinks that uh, also that bigger is more likely than smaller. So not only the models um, don't know the right truth, they, they don't know the truth here, they, uh, they are inconsistent. Even though it, both of them were trained on the same data, they saw the same not only seven examples, as I showed in my toy example, millions of examples, but the space of hypothesis that they could use is huge. And therefore, they choose a different element in this hypothesis space, a different function, and they make different predictions. Let's take one other example. Uh, this is, uh, this is a, a question answering demo that is based on these huge models. Um, uh, and, and here I'm giving uh, a sentence and then I'm asking a question about the sentence. Basically the, the, the question answering demo here tries to figure out whether we can use this model to answer questions with respect to various relations that exist in the sentence. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the question, uh, so the sentence is, Jim gave the book to his sister and she read it yesterday. So um, who read the book? Let, let's, let's ask first who read the book. And I'm gonna use the model s quiz here. You know who read the book, right? Let's run the model. We see that the model thinks that Jim read the book. That's the top answer here. Now, maybe Jim read the book also before he gave it to his sister. So let's, let's change this to who read the book yesterday. Um, the model is even more confident now that it's Jim. I'm gonna change it to another model. It's called Peakways. Uh, 
and run it. Now we think that she or his sister read the book yesterday. So again, what do we have here? Uh, we have um, two models that saw exactly the same data. They learned a little bit differently and they found different points in the hypothesis space as their target functions. They converge to different functions uh, and therefore they produce different predictions. So, so this problem that we have seen here, going back to, to my slides, uh, is a real problem. I mean, you, we have to, to think about it small to really understand what is happening, but this is the same problem that is inherent in machine learning. Uh, and you can see it here, you can look at it um, later on the slides, I put some screenshots from these uh, models. The same trending data used in a different way produced different elements in the hypothesis space uh, and therefore different predictions. Okay, so, so what does that teach us? So, so basically that says, that, that can allow us to think about what is learning really? Learning is, is uh, not a deterministic function. It's really can be, it can, really can be viewed as the removal on, of the remaining uncertainty. So I gave you some examples with their labels and you wanna know, okay, so what is the label? What are the labels of the other examples? And you have to make some additional assumptions in terms of hypothesis space, for example, as a way to nail down uh, a single function there. Uh, and you could be wrong. If you were hypothesizing that the function has to be a simple conjunction, no function is gonna be consistent with the data. If you choose it from another hypothesis space and you and me use different hypothesis spaces, we may converge to different functions. Both of them will be consistent with the training data, but will be inconsistent on future previously unseen examples, as I've shown you in the big, big models um, uh, that we are, we are using today in machine learning. Okay, so, so what should we do then? We should develop uh, strategies for how to deal with these uh, issues. And th there could be multiple strategies. One of them would be to, develop, to use very flexible, very general, uh, if you want universal hypothesis spaces like decision trees that we're gonna see next week or neural network that we're gonna see several times during the semester. Uh, uh, or we can develop representation languages that are restricted. For example, we may wanna look at specific functional representations like the N of M functions. We may wanna look at grammars and represent what we learn as grammars or stochastic models with some constraints or linear functions. Uh, in all these cases, we'll have to think about how to constrain the hypothesis space. So in the case of neural networks, the constraining is done algorithmically. The way we learn and converge to the set of weights that really define the neural network is gonna define what functions we're gonna look at and what in the space and what functions we're not gonna look at. But in all cases, we are restricting this. Um, and of course, the feature space is also gonna play a role here, but in the example I've given you, the feature space was the same, so we, we, uh, we didn't allow this level of flexibility. Now, in all cases, whether we are using a flexible hypothesis space, like decision trees or neural network, or a more constrained hypothesis space, like linear functions or grammar, or probabilistic representations, we're gonna develop algorithm that will find hypotheses that fits or almost fits. We're gonna see what's, what's best, the data. And then we hope that it's gonna do well on previously unseen data, which means it's gonna general as well. Okay, so, so again, I'm bringing up uh, this um, and reminding you that we are talking about these three issues modeling, representations, and algorithms. And I wanna dive now into a specific example 
in the context of which we are going to develop an algorithm. So the example I'm going to use now is going to be that of context sensitive spelling. So you remember that in the first uh, lecture, I showed you this nice poem that had a lot of spelling mistakes. Here is one sentence uh, that is uh, an example of this, an isolated example. I don't know whether to laugh or cry. So given the sentence, my job here is to de de determine whether it's the red weather or the blue weather that should be in this context, right? So they sound about the same or, all, or exactly the same. Uh, and I wanna be able to have a classifier that identifies if my spelling is correct. I call this context sensitive spelling because both of these words are legitimate words. So a conventional speaker, speller will not know what to do. Uh, the decision which one should be here depends on the context. So how do we make this a learning problem? So our goal is to look for some function that takes as input sentences, a sentence that has either weather blue one or weather red one, and it decides which one is correct. So for each sentence, it maps it to the correct one, the blue or the red. Now we need to define the domain of the function. Uh, here is an option. For each word W in English, I'm gonna define a Boolean feature. I'm gonna call it XW. And this Boolean feature is gonna be equal to one. I'm using these brackets here to determine to denote an indicator function, x, w, x will equal one, uh, if and only if w is in the sentence, otherwise it's zero. Um, so let's assume that I have in my vocabulary 50,000 words. That means that every sentence now is being mapped to a point in a 50,000 dimensional space zero one to the 50,000, the one I'm denoting um, uh, here. Right, in this space, some of the points are weather, red weather points, and some of them are the blue weather points. Now, just to make sure uh, we are talking about the same thing, um, uh, when I'm doing this modeling, this is not the only way to model it. In fact, this is a lossy modeling um, of the space. Anyone would suggest why this is a lossy modeling or would suggest another way to model this domain? Because uh, you could have uh, two of the same word in the same sentence. For example, if I have weather twice in the sentence, I, I, my encoding is not gonna make a distinction between these two cases. Great, another, another uh, thing that I'm losing uh, when I'm encoding the sentences this way. I think we should put like W in the, the first character in the word. So here W will be like in the middle of the word or something. Say it again, I didn't get the, the point. So the, the character W should be in the first, the first character in the, in the word. So I think what we did here, we can get many words that have W in the middle of the word or something or the end of the word. So you want, you want uh, us to, to encode character rather than just words. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so, X, so XW will be equal to one if and only if W is not, not in the sentence as a whole, but as the first character or, or something like this. Okay, so, so maybe let's, let's start with the first word. So basically what I lost here is the order of the words. Right, so, so I have 50,000 words uh, and I am coding uh, whether a word is in a sentence or not. So for example, the sentence, I don't know whether to laugh or cry, for the word I, 
I will have one. For the word no, I will have one. For the word two, I will have one. For the word laugh, I will have one, and so on. But for the word slide, I will have zero because it's not in this sentence, right? So out of the 50,000 dimensions, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight are gonna be ones. And 50,000 minus eight are gonna be zero because they are not in this sentence. But I did not encode the location of the word in the sentence, for example, right? So I don't know whether I is at the beginning of the sentence or at the end. I don't know whether two is at the beginning or the end. So I lost this information. But anyhow, this is some encoding. Of course, we can have better encoding. Um, and the instance space now becomes a set of 50,000 dimensional vectors that are very, very sparse. Very few of the entries in each vector are ones, the length of the sentence, basically. Module repetition, as you mentioned before. And um, the question is now gonna be what is the hypothesis space? So the hypothesis space is the collection of function f here that I have, and we haven't addressed this yet. So let's just think about it. So the first thing is we got to this um, learning problem where I put all the blue point and the red points the, the blue weather and the red weather from all the sentences I've read into this space. This is, it doesn't look this way, but really it's a 50,000 dimensional space where I placed this red and, uh, well, purple in this case, the, the blue turned to purple, purple examples here. And our goal is to find a function that best separates this data. So uh, what kind of function do we want? Uh, I can look for this function, for example, this green one separates the, the space. Here's another option, this red one or brown or blue. All of them are functions in this space that separate red points and purple points. And which function do we want? what is best in this case. So let's think a little bit about it. And I want you to think about it before we get to how to find it. And I want you to think about uh, this question. Uh, okay, we don't wanna show responses. So take a second and come up with these responses. I'm going to stop my video for a second. But Professor, could you say why are we trying to separate the, the points? Say it again. I didn't quite get the question. Yeah, would you, would you mind repeating why are we trying to separate the data points? Okay, so, uh, okay, before we look at the answers here, let's go back to this picture. Uh, if PowerPoint will allow me. Okay, so, so what do we want? We want a function that takes a sentence's input and tells me uh, which word to put here. And I know that the two candidates are either the blue weather or the red weather. So I need a function that says, uh, takes the sentence's input and says, this tends to be I think that this is the blue one. It's a blue sentence. Or I think that this is a red sentence. Okay, 
So now I'm encoding each sentence as a point in the space. Uh, or even before this. So, so now each point here is a sentence. And I wanna know uh, for a new sentence, these examples are already labeled, right? So some of them are purple and, or blue and some of them are red. Uh, but if I give you a new point, let's assume I put it here. I, I want to ask you, is this a red sentence? Should I use the red weather or should I put the blue weather? That's why I want to separate the points in such a way that for a future point, when I place it uh, in this 50,000 dimensional space, you will be able to give me a prediction for it. You'll be able to tell me use the red weather or the purple weather. Does this answer the question? Yeah, that makes sense. The, the points are the sentences, I think. Yes, the points are the sentences. Okay. okay, so now let's see what you guys think about this. Uh, okay, so, uh, so most of you think that it's blue because it's simpler than the green and it seems to be better than red and brown. And I agree with this. So let's go over this. Must be the green one because it separates the data perfectly. And that's true. Green separates the data perfectly. However, it's probably not gonna do well in the future. Think about, look at it here. Green separates the data perfectly. It's always possible if you can use a very, very expressive set of functions to separate the data perfectly, unless the data itself is inconsistent, but we're assuming that the data is, is good. But in the future, if I give you a point and it's gonna be here, uh, green is gonna say red, but it probably doesn't make sense that this area is red. It doesn't generalize well. It fits the data too much. Uh, definitely not green. It will not do well on the new data. That's exactly what I just said. And I see that many of you agree with that. Uh, red, not so good now, but will generalize well, which might be right because you can see that red, um, is okay at this point, maybe equivalent to brown, but blue is a little bit better because it has the same complexity. Both of them are linear functions. They are straight lines in this case now, uh, but blue seems to do better on the training data than red and brown, and therefore uh, probably will generalize better. So hopefully the 6% of you, uh, which are about 10 people that had no idea, have some idea now. If not, it's a good time to ask a question. Okay, no question. So let's move on. So, so we talked about this and now the question is, uh, we wanna be able to formalize this. Uh, and before that, uh, what are we talking about here? We're talking about issues of memorizing versus learning in some sense. So the green one, you can think about memorizing, right? It really fits the training data perfectly, but in order to fit the training data perfectly, it's not simple and it's unlikely to do well in the future. Uh, so the set of functions your algorithm is gonna learn which we call the hypothesis space, is gonna determine how the learn model will do. If you allow yourself to learn these green functions that are very, very expressive, you may do well on the training data, but who cares about training data? We care about how we're gonna do later on on previously unseen examples. Uh, and so, so that's really uh, what we care about. We wanna know uh, 
how we are going to do in the future rather than only in the training data. Okay, but let's start by kind of trying to formalize what we are doing here. So, so here is a possibility for us, rather than just say, okay, just separate the data any way you want. Let's say that I'm going to define the learning problem to be separates the data using a linear function. Uh, and here your homework one refresher comes to play. And I'm going to remind you what do I mean when I say linear function. So when I say linear here, I mean linear in the, in the feature space. So I'm going to denote here by X my data representation. It's going to be the sentence, the vector encoding of the sentence. W is going to be my classifier. Think about it now as a weight for each of the features. So W and X are gonna be column vectors of dimensionality N, let's say 50,000 here. And my prediction is gonna be the dot product of W transpose X, and I'm gonna take a sign of it. So just to remind you, I know you all know this, uh, by dot product here, I mean the linear sum of WI XI, where I runs from one to N, and by sign here, I just mean a step function that says uh, if what's inside here uh, is negative, say zero. If what's inside here is not negative, say one. Okay, so, so my predictor just says zero or one, even though the number here, the dot product is really a real valued number, right? Because the weights could be any real valued number. So, so that's how I define my problem now. I disallow green functions. I just allow blue or red or brown linear functions. Uh, and I formally define what I mean by uh, linear function. Uh, so I'm gonna skip the next few slides that are, uh, or in fact, I'm gonna do a small detour now to talk a little bit about expressivity of functions. So, so we can have some better intuition for what do I mean when I talk about linear functions and is this good or bad or, um, or somewhere in the middle. So, so let's think about uh, this set of points. Again, I have blue points and red points. I'm claiming that these data points are not linearly separable in one dimension. That is, there is no way to take a simple function, a linear function, and separate the blue uh, from the red. I hope you agree with me. Uh, however, uh, I can not insist on using a specific class of function, linear function. I can say, you know, take a green function again, right? And with this green function, I separated the blue from the red. So now, if you know this uh, green function, this green function below the line, below the green function, I will say blue. Above the green function, I will say red, and I have a function. But this is way too expressive. What do I want if I want to use the simple function, that linear function, and separate the red and the blue? Here is a trick. I'm gonna change the way I represent the data. Instead of just represented it as X before, as before here, just I encoded the X value. Uh, here I'm gonna encode X and X square. So now I'm representing these data points instead of on one axis, I'm gonna represent it on two axes, X and X square. Notice that I added no information because I knew X, so I knew X squared. But now the blue points look like this, the red points look like this, and there is a linear function in the two dimensional space that separates them. Magic trick in some sense, right? I added no information, but now I can separate the data. And that's a really, really important trick that we're gonna do all the time. All neural networks are doing it. All learned models are doing it in order to be able to learn with a given set of functions. You change the representation of the input 
so that a given set of function is expressive enough to represent it. So uh, this is the first time we see here how powerful representations are. Um, so really the key issue is what features to use. What this example shows, don't just use X as the feature. Use X and X square as the feature. And magically, you can now separate the data with a simple set of functions. So of course, computationally, we're gonna do this in various ways. For example, using kernels, uh, and we will get to it uh, later in the semester, but, but conceptually, this is a really, really important idea. Uh, now, the same idea can also happen in the discrete space, where we have Boolean features uh, or, or other categorical feature instead of continuous features as we saw. For, for example, this function, the conjunction of X1 and X2 is linear. Think about why this is true and we're gonna get to it in the next slide. But this function, x1 and x2, or not x1 and not x2, is not linear. Uh, and in general, this is uh, a class of, that we call parity function. Some of you might have seen it. Uh, and they are hard to separate. They are not linearly separate. Uh, what's happening here? So, so why is it true that X1 and X2 is linear? Let, let's, let's think about it this way. So, so here is the set, uh, the game that we're playing here. We are thinking about these linear functions. I already introduced this linear function a few slides ago. I'm adding one other component here. Before I introduced this as dot product of WX, now I'm also adding this minus theta. So I'm shifting uh, the dot product by some constant theta. This is the definition, as we said before, a linear sum over all the features i run from one to n of w i x i minus theta. Um, and, and I want to argue that this set of functions, which are linear functions, is quite expressive. For example, this conjunction over five variables for now, x1 up to x5, this is my x here. I'm calling it X transpose because I always think about vectors as column vectors, and it's easier for me to write here as a row. So I'm arguing that this conjunction is actually a linear function. Now conjunctions are kind of good representation. Think about a definition of a dog. Uh, dogs have four legs and they bark and they have tails and maybe other things. So this is maybe a simplistic representation of dogs, but it gives you the idea that conjunctive representation could represent potentially interesting concepts. So what, does, what do I mean when I say that this is a linear function? I mean that there is a set of weights, a vector W and a threshold theta, such that Y is gonna be equal to X1, X3 and X5 um, is one if and only if this function is one. So this function is one when this is one, and this function is zero when this is zero. So, so let's try this. Uh, I'm asking this question again. What do I mean when uh, I say that the function uh, x1, n, x3, n, x5 is a linear function? I want you to give me a set of weights over the five variables and a threshold, which I denote here T because I don't know how to write theta on Paul everywhere, that show that this is true. So essentially what you have to give me is six numbers, the five W's and the T, and choose it in such a way that it will show that this conjunction is a linear function. Is the question clear? Okay, so let's see what you guys uh, are thinking. 
okay, WT minus theta is not an answer. Okay, but here is, a, here, here is an answer. So X1 plus X3 plus X5 minus 2.1, but you didn't give me the vector. An equivalent answer is this, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and threshold of three. Some people suggest a threshold of two. Uh, so, so notice that the answers that do not give me five weights and a threshold are incorrect. Now, it's not the unique answer. There are other possibilities. For example, uh, okay, this is incomplete, but it's going in the right direction. Of course, I could choose also the weights to be two, zero, two, zero, two, and the threshold would be four, for example, or four and a half. But basically, I think many of you got this. If you did not, think about it and look at the next uh, slides. Okay, so um, here is the solution, but I want you all to think about it. Uh, the solution is here for conjunctions. Think about how to do it for this junction. Think about how to do it for at least M out of N functions. Um, and then convince yourself that Oh, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> uh, that uh, this gives rise to functions that are not um, linear sometimes. Okay, I'm gonna stop here and ask you a couple of questions before we I want to ask two questions before we are done uh, for today. This is one question. Uh, and we're going to stop with this. Uh, and continue and get to an algorithm, which I didn't get to today, uh, next time. Uh, while we are looking at this, uh, any comments or questions before we, we finish? I have a quick question about the uh, kernel learning from a couple slides ago. Yes. Um, so when we have all of the data points on just X space, we weren't able to separate the points. Um, but I was just wondering like where, uh, the, the second feature when we represented it in X and X squared space, just to summarize, this means that we can generate a new feature based on a given feature that we already have, right? Um, because to be able to represent it in two dimensions, we need two features. So let's say we're only given one feature. What you're saying is that we can generate another feature based on the first that can help us represent the variable in multiple dimensions. Is that correct? Right. So, so yeah, I, I think that's right. Let me just say it in a slightly different way. So basically what I showed is that there is a difference between the information we have, which in this case is just the X value of the example, and the representation that we provide to our learning algorithm. If we provide just the X, we cannot separate the data with a given set of functions. If instead we provide it, we say, okay, we're not going to do, deal with it in one dimensions. We're going to deal with it in two dimensions. And we provide to the learning algorithm X comma X square. 
in this two-dimensional space, we can separate the data with a simple function. So we increased the dimensionality of the data, but we did not add more information. And in some sense, it's magical. You can say, you know, what's going on? I mean, how come without adding more information, uh, you can do now something that you couldn't do before. But re remember that we also changed the dimensionality. Before we worked in a single dimension, now we are working in two dimensions. So, so basically th this exemplifies why representations are so important. Uh, if you go back to the example that I, uh, the question that I asked earlier today about the features for the email classification problem. And I asked the question, I'm gonna finish with this. Uh, thank you for, for the, the comments, uh, by the way. I wanna, I wanna go back to this and, and finish with this slide. Um, I ask here a question. Here are two features. Does this email contain the word class? Does this email contain the word waiting? These are two pieces of information. Now, this is a conjunctive features. Does this email contain the word class and the word waiting? And I ask, did, I, did it add anything? Well, it did not add information, but it added expressivity. And if you use this type of feature, you may need a simpler function in the learning stage than if you use these two features. And we're gonna talk a, a lot more on that. I'm gonna start with this point again uh, on Wednesday before we get to the algorithm. Uh, okay, so let's stop here. I wanna remind you that we have office hours. We have recitations uh, twice this week and expect a quiz uh, that will be out late on Thursday. And have a good rest of the week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.